It's strange that the mind has to talk to itself. But then when you think about the different roles that self, that function in becoming, you can understand. There's the self that wants to enjoy pleasure, the self that feels that it can provide for that consumer self by doing whatever is needed to provide that pleasure. And then there's the self as commentator that speaks to the other two, telling the self as consumer what kinds of things it should or should not accept as legitimate pleasure, and telling the self as provider what to do. And of course the commentator will comment on itself sometimes. The Buddha calls all this directed thought and evaluation. And it's in our directed thought and evaluation that our sense of self largely resides. And if you like the way you talk to yourself, you tend to be at ease with yourself. If you're driven crazy by all the voices in your mind, you might want to say, I'd rather have no self at all. This may be one of the reasons why people like the idea of no self getting rid of those voices. Because you can't just get rid of the voices. You have to train them first. In the same way the Buddha's approach to self and not self, you have to train your sense of self so that it's skillful. If you try to get rid of yourself when it's unskillful, there's usually a lot of aversion behind that desire. And it creates more problems. So to solve the problem, you have to train the way you talk to yourself. It may feel unnatural at first to have a different kind of conversation inside, because your old conversations, your old ways of talking to yourself are really familiar. But then if you couldn't change your ways, the Buddha wouldn't have bothered to teach. The fact that he did bother, and he bothered a lot, 45 years of bothering, going out of his way to teach this person, that person. Think of all the difficult people he had to teach. We read the stories of Angulimala, Devadatta, Sanchaka, and then all the monks and nuns who created trouble in ways that forced him to formulate the Vinaya. The Buddha went to great lengths to teach people to talk to themselves in new ways. And of course, from the talking to themselves, and they would learn to act in new ways. So this is why meditation starts, by talking to yourself, directed thought and evaluation. You direct your thoughts to the breath, and then you learn what kind of evaluation is useful and what kind is not. The kind of evaluation that looks at your actions and can tell you whether they're skillful or not right here, right now, and then can offer constructive ideas about how you might want to change. That's the kind of evaluation you want. As for other things outside of that, for the time being, you let them go. I mean, there will be occasions as you leave formal meditation where you have to talk to yourself about other things. But hopefully you begin to pick up the, the right attitude is how to talk to yourself in such a way that you stay on a skillful topic, a useful topic, and that your criticism is constructive. And you learn how to think up new ways of approaching things that have been problems all along. So focus on the breath. Talk to yourself about the breath. How does it feel right now? I noticed when John Fung was teaching his students, he would have them describe how they were feeling the breath. And then he would use their vocabulary to talk to them. There was one guy who had had trouble getting the mind to settle down with the breath. And then one day he was sitting on a bus, going from a town outside of Bangkok into Bangkok. And he ran into what he described as the delicious breath. So from that point on, John Fuang, when he was teaching meditation to this guy, would say, okay, get to the delicious breath. 
to see if you can stay there. So what kind of breathing would you find delicious right now? Scrumptious, satisfying, gratifying. Refreshing inside. Think of what you would like to have right now and see if you can provide a breath that does that. In some cases, all you have to do is think that way and the body will respond. Other times, it, it's a little slow to respond. So you experiment. But as you adjust the breath, try not to use a heavy hand to adjust it. Because after all, you're looking for pleasure, and heavy hands tend not to be pleasurable. There are occasionally times when you will have to breathe in a way that is uncomfortable. I found that when I had migraines, that one way of getting out of a cycle of breathing that seemed to be aggravating the migraines was to breathe in, fill up the lower part of my torso as much as I could, expand it as much as I could, even to the point where it was painful. And that was would reset my breathing. So there are times when uncomfortable breathing has its role. But for the most part, you want to get to a spot where it just feels good to be right here, right now. In whatever sense of hunger you have for pleasurable feelings in the body, you have a way of breathing that satisfies that hunger. The more you can do this, the more likely the mind will be to settle down. And without even thinking about it, you've trained yourself to talk in new ways, because you've posed new questions. And you've allowed your mind to think of new ways of providing answers. And it's in this way that you train your sense of self, so the self can be its own mainstay, and it can <coughs> mainstay. It can be its own governing principle. The self as a mainstay, of course, is the self that you can rely on to provide the happiness you want. The self as a governing principle is reminding yourself, I came to this practice because I want happiness. If I give up on the practice, does that mean I don't want happiness anymore? And then you're going to ask yourself, well, how have I been going about the practice in such a way that seems to be getting away from happiness? Oh, Richard, this is the self as the consumer. And of course, the commentator is commenting on what you want to do and how you might better do it. So you're training all three aspects of self, consumer, producer, commentator. As you learn how to talk to yourself in more fruitful ways, this is how you learn how to depend on yourself. This is how you become your own teacher. This is a point that John Fung made often, that you can depend on outside teachers only so much. For one thing, they're not there all the time. And secondly, you should know your problems better than anybody else. When a teacher is talking about ways of dealing with the breath energy, it's usually based on what he or she has experienced. How you experience your breath may be a little bit different. So you have to take the instructions and adjust them. And of course, there are times when you're meditating and things come up and you can't go running to the teacher all the time. You've got to learn how to figure things out. This is where the element of ingenuity comes in, thinking up new questions so you can arrive at new answers. If you just keep asking the same old questions over and over and over again, you're going to get the same answers pretty much. For instance, when I was reading John Mahabhava's instructions to the woman who was dying of cancer. I was struck by how many of the questions he had her ask about the pain would never have occurred to me. And for me, that was the most useful part of the book, realizing that you can ask different questions, try to find new ways of evaluating which your questions are all about. You're trying to find new ways of getting something better. So learn to think in terms of new questions. 
Where is the breath coming from? Does it come from inside the body or outside the body? There's a passage in Dogen, the Zen master, where he has you ask questions like that. Where is your mind right now? Is the mind in the body? Is the body in the mind? Ask questions to loosen up the way you're relating to things in the present moment. And ask questions that are related to the present moment. So many of our ways of thinking, our conversations to ourselves have to do with what we're planning to do or what we did do in the past. We're not paying that much attention to what we're actually doing right now. And to look at that requires a different set of questions. Where is the intention right now? Think in terms of those aggregates. Where are the intentions? Where are the perceptions? What exactly are the feelings right now? Are the feelings the same as the breath? Is your awareness the same thing as the breath? There are times in the meditation when it's actually helpful to think about the breath and the awareness going together as they spread through the body. Other times when you ask yourself, well, are they the same? So train yourself to talk to yourself in new ways. Train yourself to ask questions of yourself in new ways. And that way you train yourself to be a more useful self in the path. There will come a point where you don't need that sense of self anymore, but you don't drop it out of aversion. It's more like a tool that you've used, and then when you no longer need the tool, you just put it aside. Because you need to use it right now, because you want to take responsibility. Years back when I was doing a brief introduction to the Buddhist teachings, I was looking at what other people had written in their introductions. And I was struck by a strange pattern. Often they would start out by saying that the Buddha taught a religion where you have to rely on yourself, you don't rely on outside powers. But then toward the end of the little booklet, they would say something about, how, well, there is no self. And I'd wonder why nobody had ever noticed that before, a self-reliant religion where there is no self. It doesn't make any sense. What does make sense is that as long as you're going to create a sense of self, make it a, a reliant self, something you can actually use. Because after all, what is our sense of self? It's one of our ways of trying to look for happiness, our strategy for trying to decide what will be worthwhile keeping, what will be worthwhile doing for the sake of what lasts inside of us. And so we're learning how to take that strategy and use it skillfully on the path. We're looking for long-term welfare and happiness. Who's going to do it? We're going to do it. Who's going to reap the benefits. We're going to reap the benefits. Okay, that's where you need that sense of self. That is, you learn how to talk to yourself in more and more skillful ways and ask questions about what's going on. And finally, turn, turn the questions on the commentator, turn the questions on the consumer and the producer. Turn the questions on, well, who is this who's asking the questions? Who is this that's giving the orders? when you find that you don't need that sense of self anymore, that it's actually getting in the way of more refined work inside, because then you put it aside. This is when you're working with tools on a piece of furniture. There comes a point where you don't need the saws anymore. Everything has been sawed. When you put things together, then it becomes simply a matter of finishing. So the hammers and the nails, you put those aside. You hold on to the sandpaper and the various things to get the finish right, and then you put those down too. So when you'll be talking to yourself, you'll find that the issue of what is this phenomenon of talking to yourself all about becomes more and more the issue, as other issues have been taken care of. But take care of the other issues first. Learn how to talk to yourself well. People try to let go of their internal dialogue without having trained it properly, operating out of aversion. 
And that, of course, is an unskillful mind state which leads to unfortunate results. So learn how to talk in a way that you like the way you talk to yourself because it's useful. It gets good results. Then you can think about putting it aside. <laughs>